The broadcast of the regular meeting of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission Audit Subcommittee will now begin. Good afternoon and welcome to the regular meeting of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission Audit Subcommittee for June 21st, 2021. I am Robert Jackson Pino and I am the chair of this subcommittee. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. This meeting will be recorded and posted to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota open meeting law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum is present for this meeting. Commissioner Crockett. Commissioner Sparks. Present. Chair Pino. Present. There are two members present. Let the record reflect we have a quorum and we will begin the meeting. Next, we'll proceed to our agenda, a copy of which has been posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. The first motion is the adoption of the agenda. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Uh, I will make such a motion. I Sparks. hear a motion by Commissioner Sparks. Uh, can the clerk call the roll? Commissioner Crockett. Commissioner Sparks. Aye. Chair Pino. Aye. There are two ayes. That motion carries and the agenda is adopted. Next matter of business is the acceptance of the minutes from May 25th, 2021. May I have a motion to accept the minutes? Commissioner Sparks, I will make such a motion. I hear a motion from Commissioner Sparks. May it, will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Crockett. Commissioner Sparks. Aye. Chair Pino. Aye. There are two ayes. That motion carries and the minutes for May 2021 uh, are accepted. The next order of business is the acceptance of public comments. I will now open the floor and invite comments from the community. We'll limit public comment period to no more than two minutes per speaker. Uh, and with that in mind, I will remind speakers to press star six to unmute themselves, state their names for the record before uh, they give their, their two minutes. Uh, are there any members of the community who would wish to address the subcommittee? We do have one person uh, attending by phone. I'll give about 20 more seconds for that individual if they want to leave public comment. Star 6 to unmute yourself. All right, hearing no uh, speakers from the community, I'll move on to unfinished business from our May meeting. Uh, two items uh, in this section, first being uh, no-knock warrants that was postponed from May to this meeting, an ongoing discussion that I do believe we left off uh, with a report from uh, city staff about feasibility uh, and if possible, I would like to uh, have uh, some sort of short update from staff on what's been going on between last meeting and this meeting. Um, and then Commissioner Sparks, since you weren't here, we can kind of you know rehash and make sure you have time to express your opinion as well on both of these items. We'll start with, with no knock warrants. Um, and I do see perfect timing. Commissioner Crockett has uh, has joined us. I will uh, 
I will acknowledge for the record that Commissioner Crockett is present and attending if he could confirm uh, that his audio is working. Yep, yep, sorry about the tardiness. No worries, we're happy to have you. You you just uh, joined us in the um, unfinished business. We we're picking right back up where we left off last month regarding uh, no-knock warrants. Um, and I do see we have staff that are on camera now, uh, Andrew and Christopher. Um, would either one of you be willing to um, uh, give either a, you know, a summary of any work that's happened between now and uh, you know, between last meeting and now uh, regarding no knock warrants? Sure, I'm happy to start off and then hand it over to Christopher here if he wants to dive into some of the details. So um, since we last met, I know we had um, like built out, I know we had a chance to discuss it a little bit, but um, that kind of longer uh, comparison document mm -hmm. that was put together that looked at some different municipalities um, and kind of what their policies were around no-knock warrants um, as compared to you know um, what currently exists in MPD. Uh, we'd also, uh, Christopher had pulled a study from, and I'm going to forget the acronym um, of the group, uh, Christopher, but like one of the um, kind of a police oversight, I, I think style groups that had done um, like a pretty comprehensive uh, review of um, existing no-knock policies and recommendations. Um, so that was included as well for everybody to take a look at. Um, and then I know one of the other things, and this is where I'll end it off to Christopher, um, was starting to kind of go through and figure out, you know, what's the easiest way for us to isolate um, the available uh, no-knock warrant? You know, like, like, like what's the easiest way to pull this data essentially, yeah. since there's not like one single repository and, you know, how can we identify these cases? Because I think that's something where, you know, we've discussed a white paper, which I think at this point, there's probably enough uh, material with all of you to um, start to go, you know, to go that route and kind of get that initial um, like step done. But then for a more substantive dive um, into looking at, you know, um, you know the, the, the various reasons that a no-knock warrant was requested, what were the outcomes and kind of be, like, you know, find a way to be able to measure um, kind of those outcomes against each other to determine if there's a certain area where no-knock warrants are being used or requested or just, you know, the outcomes of those warrants are just, you know, it, this doesn't match up. It just doesn't seem like it merits. Um, you know, like the risk that's involved in um, going through that process. So for the, the more in-depth stuff, then Christopher's the one that's doing it um, in the day-to-day, -day, I'm going to hand it over to him. So after last meeting, I did um, look at some of the availability of this information and the search warrants are filed with the court. They're publicly available, um, but it is not easy to search the warrants to kind of go through the breakdown of why the warrant was issued um, for the cases. Uh, I did look at the uh, dispatch data for search warrants in uh, 2019. Um, 2020 is not a complete complete year for search warrants because you yeah. know COVID affected the ability of search warrants to be issued as well as other police resources. Um, and for 2019, there were two questions or kind of breakdowns I was able to quickly gather from that information. Um, and this is based on how the calls are logged with the dispatch system. So for Minneapolis police, they do log calls that are done outside of the city with their own dispatch as well as the local dispatch. We don't have access to any data for dispatch outside of the city. city. Mm. Um, so city of Minneapolis, 87% of their search warrants were within the city, city limits and 13% were outside of city limits. And then for the breakdown of the search warrants conducted in Minneapolis, 46% um, were general search warrants that were issued. 10% uh, was Hennepin County, 1% uh, was to assist other agencies, and then 43% was SWAT team deployments. Okay. And the the SWAT team deployments themselves, since we're talking about no-knock warrants, uh, I imagine there is some strong correlation there between SWAT team deployments and no knock warrants. Is that a correct assumption to have? And how do we? Uh, so the the dispatch data would not specify if it's no knock versus mm -hmm. a SWAT team just happens to be there. But mm -hmm. yeah, usually when a warrant is classified as high risk, um, which would include all no knocks as well as some other categories according to the policies, that's when SWAT would be used. Okay, so there's a there is a potential relationship there, but not necessarily an exclusive one. Yeah, it would be it would be search warrants where no knock is either used or um, it's considered high risk due to weapons or that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I guess potentially it, is there the inverse possible as well? No knock warrants would be uh, available in other 
percentages that you've described that don't necessarily include SWAT team deployment? Um, my understanding by, by the policy is that all no knocks are considered high risk, which would require a SWAT team to be present. Okay. Yeah, um, I just, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that it's, it's articulated that it would have to be a SWAT team is present. Okay. Yeah, Hennepin County would have their own policies, so there is the potential that uh, warrants that are purely with Hennepin County would have their own criteria. And you talked about it in terms of percentages, 43% uh, for that SWAT team. What What's the ballpark figure, like an absolute number? Uh, there were 462 um, search warrants that were, list they were listed as search warrants in dispatch for 2019. Okay. Which include a SWAT team deployment. Okay. Sorry, that was the the total number of search. Oh, rooms. and forty three percent of them included a SWAT team deployment. Yes, that's correct. Okay. 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 Thank you. So that's. Again, really ballpark because I don't have a calculator here. Just under 200, like 180 ish. Um, potential uh, data set that we can pull from. Um, I guess what's important here because we, we have the three of us together for the first time in, in two months is to really. Um, have a firm understanding of we've had a conversation about feasibility here um, and getting information from Andrew and Christopher, and I thank you both for that. I just want to make sure that we are making a like a focused and concerted effort going forward in defining uh, our methodology appropriately, right? Um, we had a presentation, which was great. We had uh, now follow up information which is awesome. Um, and we have these two different avenues to approach, uh, you know, studying and coming to an understanding of no knock warrants and their potential impact uh, in the city, right? Um, one being the white paper, the other being a more long term perspective. And I think it's it's worth starting these conversations off of saying, you know, clearly defining scope uh, and being, you know, very articulate in that of what are the types of questions we want to ask, what sort of questions are are not necessarily relevant here, um, and really starting to build a paper trail, if you will, um, so that way when staff is is doing, you know, part of this work in between these meetings, they have a core foundation to uh, center their their work on. I call that a conceptual framework or like foundational, you know, questions, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and I would definitely like to spend a few minutes uh, really narrowing down to, you know, three really key questions that we want to have, uh, you know, answers to at the end of all of this. Does that sound like a, a fair um next step in this process for the two of you cool and i know we've kind of done this before we were brainstorming different ideas uh back when this was first referred to us but now that we've had some exposure to this we've seen some comparisons uh from city staff uh between our policies and uh you know the other comparable cities um and we have a sense of data that is available of a, a, a particular data set. Um, maybe we should start there of, of saying, you know, essentially, given that we have, you know, 43% of 462, 180, 190 ish uh, data points from dispatch. Correct me if I'm wrong, Christopher, from dispatch that we can potentially use to 
to describe uh, or at least uh, pull some information out on the relationship between no-knock warrants versus declared warrants. And I know there's a specific terminology in the city, announced versus unannounced, is that it? Yeah, that's, that's correct. So the, um, yeah. the dispatch logs are a little bit bare bones on data, you know, it's just when Mm -hmm. you know checking with checking with the radios uh but those case numbers would translate across we could also potentially then match the dates up with other records okay okay and those other records are are we thinking it's coming from hennepin county or is that something that's not uh is that a little bit bigger of a task from like a, a feasibility standpoint to um draw it is it is a bigger task because that would involve looking at the search warrants. Mm -hmm. um, and if we have to get them from court records with the county, then you know that requires going in person to the court records system and obtaining copies of them. Um, the copies also aren't free. Yeah. So there would need to be some logistics worked out about how, how to do that. And then it would require manually going through the search warrants. I guess uh, but my my pre question before the the commissioners start really asking some of these fundamental questions. Since you're the one who's looked at this data, what jumps out as you? What sort of uh, questions or uh, uses of this data would be uh, the the best? You know, for uh, what we've already loosely described in, in our interests around no knock warrants. What do you think would be the best use of that data? So I think looking at the uh, the comparisons that were both offered by um, was, was it No Knock Minnesota and also the uh, Center for Criminal Justice, um, you know they they had some some areas that they kind of highlighted as being what they would believe to be best practices. So I think something you could look at is the the number of search warrants that fall outside of that. So for example, Minnesota statute allows a No Knock warrant for preservation of evidence. Uh, I believe both those organizations recommended search warrants to not be just for the preservation of evidence. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, look at the number of times where that is that is issued. Um, I also think looking at that rubric, there was not a policy on the use of flashbangs or or uh, distraction devices. Um, I also think from starting to look at this data that this is an area where the reporting requirements um, aren't easy to follow so you know you can we can go and get copies of search warrants from the courts but it's not accessible in the same way that say the data dashboards are for other areas of uh, mpds um you know like the use of force dashboard and and so on um and that was something that was recommended by no knock minnesota was to have a framework for reporting the the cases mm -hmm. um and then the final area that we kind of looked at was the way in which warrants can be applied for so some departments had you know, they restricted supervisors had to review a warrant or a prosecutor could. Minneapolis seems to be geared more towards the investigators can opt to seek guidance. Yeah, instead um, of like must opt or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and then yeah. I think anything beyond that, you know, you need to look at those and kind of think about the, the potential information that could be out there. So, for example, how many warrants are successful versus, you know, they uh, meaning that no contraband is found and mm -hmm. and that kind of information. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, I, so I'm I'm already curious about uh, what the other commissioners would think now that we've had that sort of uh, discussion on the you know Christopher's opinion on how this data could be used potentially. Uh, and we've we've shopped around a few ideas before, one of which I think was the last thing that he mentioned of, you know, defining success in no knock warrants. Um, we came at it from a perspective of success from a, uh, a health and safety perspective. Uh, but I think both are really useful of, you know, uh, a a classical law enforcement uh, definition of success in terms of, you know, uh, achieving the contraband or, you know, making the arrest that was initially the prompt of the warrant, uh, as well as success by something I, I believe Commissioner Crockett mentioned is uh, in terms of health and safety of the individuals that uh, reside in the area that is being uh, 
uh, you know, uh, entered by the police. Um, and that might be a different type of conversation of whether or not we can get that sort of data. But uh, I, I think those two ideas of of success and rates of success for each of those different values is something that I think is is a core question that I've seen uh, in the past couple meetings here. Um, what are the thoughts from the two of you regarding that and and other thoughts? Um, I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you kind of gave a, a really good, uh, summary there, Jackson, um, of kind of like defining success. Um, so just, just wanted to kind of second, um, what you, what you mentioned. Um, and then I, I did think it was really interesting. Um, Chris's question of like, or recommended question of like, the flashbang and the um, preservation of evidence. Um, I thought those two um, mm. were really interesting, kind of critical thinking type of questions to 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 get an understanding because it's um, preservation of evidence, and then I guess question is like, is that the most common? Uh, one that's kind of mentioned, or is there like a trending, you know, trending uh, uh, re or reasons or rationales they provide as why they do it or have done it? Yeah, I'm, I'm always, I'm really curious. I'm always really curious about the um, the rationales versus the outcome <clears throat> if they use. Um, some of those uh, data points, if you will, to justify getting uh, an unannounced warrant or a no-knock warrant versus what what was actually the uh, the outcome. I don't I don't even know if it's tracked, but it's interesting that uh, preservation of evidence is one that I hadn't considered. Uh, yeah, and it makes me wonder if if those are being overused, underused. What the real life outcome is versus what they're just marking on the paper. If there's a disconnect. Um, Pretty interested in comparing those. Uh, I do want to say that uh, Commissioner Pino, you're so you're always so thorough in your uh, in your explanations and your summaries. I'm usually not left with a whole lot of commentary myself. You usually yeah. take the words out of my mouth. Well, I, I apologize. I know I tend to oh, no. talk a lot, so I want to make sure that it's not just me talking. It's you know it's a discussion about that. Not at all. I think you. I mean, you cover you cover a lot of bases. I meant that more in a positive way. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew, you have your hand raised? Yep, yep. I'm just uh, something to Chris's point. Sorry, I remember how to take my hand back down. There we go. Um, um, just, uh, yeah, like to a point that Chris had made too, I think this is important. Um, like at the, like the stage that we're at with this is there's some of the, like some of the topics that he mentioned, I think there's both the deep dive, you know, where you're going to be able to go into it and find kind of that substantive data that's, um, you know, that, that we're going to get on the back end. But then there's also that, um, that point that we're at now where, you know, if, if there's a policy that doesn't exist, is it something where you want to look at it and basically say, like, hey, listen, like we've looked at some, you know, similar cities, some recommendations from national agencies that, you know, that have identified that this might be a gap. Like, you know, just having any policy is better than none. Mm -hmm. And then once you have, you know, so that would be something that could be in a recommendation paper. And then once we have the other data, that's when you can come at it, you know, perhaps you know more forcefully, where it's like we actually found this, and now you know we have a more like formalized, um, like you know, so it's it's one, it's sort of a two stage like process. Again, like if the group would rather go in a different direction and like, and wait to make a recommendation on a policy until we have like a full substantive data poll, we can definitely do that. But like I know the one, um, the, uh, it was in that when we did the comparison rubric, um, it's in the, I think we mentioned it in there, but the with um, respect to the flashbangs and um, those types of things being used, I believe right now the policy procedure manual generally speaks about those with regard to um, use in protest cases. So I don't know. I don't know if if it's really addressed. You know, their use in no knock is addressed at all. So like that could you know. And I think the no knock or the no knock Minnesota presentation had mentioned. You know, it was like you know, I mean, they can only be used in the uh, after like exigent circumstances have been identified. Which you know, like that in and of itself is not a super restrictive clause. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, like it doesn't. You know, they weren't even suggesting that like they can never be used. It just basically says you know, just so that we know that there is some bar for them being used. 
Um, so I feel like like that's one of those things that you know you could easily make that recommendation just in like you know a, 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 the white paper type format and then continue to do uh, you know like the the bigger data dive where we might find out that you know the you know in, in X amount of cases you know there was you know the circumstances don't seem like they rose this level and then you could come back with more formalized tweaks. But mm -hmm. um, so that was just something I did want to raise just so that I I think there's for a number of the items that Christopher had identified I think there's parallel tracks where you know doing it in one capacity doesn't mean you can't do it in the other. Okay. That is, that is good to know. And uh, do you, I mean, we. I am of the opinion that the work that Christopher's already put in uh, is sufficient to at least bring up and acknowledge some holes in a white paper um, and, and at least prompt some considerations. Uh, not necessarily saying there is founded evidence in our particular practices, because we haven't looked at those practices, right? But we can at least say, here's how other cities are doing it. Here is what a, pers a particular perspective on an ideal is around, uh, you know, no-knock warrants uh, and some regulations that have been thrown around. Have you considered these? Uh, definitely a softer approach. Um, what are your thoughts, commissioners, in terms of uh, what what would you like a white paper to say? Um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, something that is faster. How how um, committed do you want to be to either making a a f more formal and significant recommendation uh, to some of the the holes that I think have been illuminated in the differences between uh, that rubric of ideas that uh, the city could consider but hasn't yet versus just acknowledging that there are differences that exist. I know that was kind of wordy, but do you want to be more, you know, direct and saying hey let's change these things or do you want to be more soft and and saying there are differences that we see you should look at them too i'm sort of curious uh what the commission has done in the past like what given those two tracks what approach the commission has taken and how successful those have been because i'm i'm not sure uh what the past experience yeah has been like I'll, I'll say from my personal experience uh a lot of the times uh yeah i've only been here for a year right but yeah. uh when we have discussions like this and there are people listening uh, often those discussions will potentially lead to internal changes that happen we might not even have to get to the point of writing a paper and just having that conversation could be enough in some instances. Yeah. Uh, others, it, it does require, you know, some sort of publishing, you know, either by ourselves or in cooperation with OPCR uh, and giving more of a, a formal recommendation. I, I, I'll leave it to Andrew if you want to speak more to about the, you know, uh, a firm recommendation approach versus just exposing a, a hole where it is and which one might be more feasible. Yeah, I mean, in this case, I think that the, the idea behind it is if you make a recommendation in some area where it doesn't seem like, you know, there's just a policy is lacking. I mean, mm -hmm. even if, you know, if you can make that recommendation based on best practices, I mean, it still is valid. And even if, you know, we do the deeper dive into the data and we determine that, you know what, that area wasn't anything that, you know, there's no evidence that it's been problematic. At the end of the day, I mean, addressing, you know, the, the lack of a policy still could in and of itself be an issue. Um, so I think that, again, like I said before, it's like one's not going to negate the other. I mean, if anything, it could just give you more, uh, you know, like a more substantive like, like platform for you know, recommending something further. Um, I mean, I think it's also an opportunity, you know, to just say that you did raise it. I mean, you know, like these things, you know, like, like, the, like the ongoing like research stuff, I mean, every, you know, when we do the deeper dives, it just takes, you know, it takes some more time. So, you know, like if, Again, like it, and some of it comes down to perception of risk in the interim of, of having not done it. So, I mean, sometimes it's nice just to basically provide them the opportunity to say, hey, listen, this is something we want to look into, but, you know, here's like a very practical solution or suggestion. And like that gives them the opportunity to do something proactively. Um, so, you know, it's one where as far as, you know, again, I can't speculate on like what the outcome would be. 
but I think just you know sort of having that document like, like that you know having that document that I think just kind of further strengthens whatever you're going to do on the back end where you can say you know hey like we had you know made these recommendations and you know at that point you can see you know was anything adopted because if it you know if it wasn't and the findings show that like what you had recommended actually was an area where you know there have been some you know like there are some like notable issues and I think it just further strengthens you know the ability to you know to make you know probably a more comprehensive uh, series of suggestions around that specific topic so hopefully that made sense I think so thank you um because I yeah I have this impression that um <clears throat> Based, uh, just based on what I've seen so far in the emails and some of the emails that Chuck sends and stuff like uh, recommendations may or may not be um, uh, or, or even people just pointing out gaps may or may not be responded to. It seems like often they're and I don't know why, but it seems like often they're not. But the, the follow up is almost more important. And in some ways than how we uh, present it, like we keep bringing it up until we hear something or we see a change somewhere. Um, and that's something we have. I, I think we should consider to mm -hmm. and, and I agree with that which is why I think we've kind of struggled with this idea of white paper get something out quickly versus a long-term research and study uh, we want to be time sensitive with this sort of thing at least let people know um, and, and and I'll just put in here for the record uh, so that way we're all on the same page when we're talking about differences I'm talking about this rubric that was provided to us um, in our uh let's make sure i'm referencing this appropriately in our uh may 25th uh subcommittee meeting um it is in unfinished business under line item six no knock warrants uh for those of you watching on youtube you can find it on the limbs website may 25th this subcommittee um and that this is what uh I know uh, Commissioner Crockett saw this because um, we talked about it at the last meeting. I know Commissioner Sparks, you weren't here for it. So I want to make sure that you had a chance, at least in this space, to look at it as well. Um, and I, I, I encourage anyone's discussion, either commissioners or staff, uh, to give an opinion of, is this enough? information to start the core foundations of a white paper um, specifically commissioners do you want to start a white paper based off of this information and if so staff feasibility on starting a white paper uh, based with the information that you have collected so far I mean, really quickly uh, um, just before um, like anybody else jumps in like I was going to say too if you know have sent the white paper around if, if this is something where since it seems like there there isn't any explicit issue that I you know and again like this is up to the group so I, if I'm misinterpreting this let me know there's not you know of all the stuff we talked about so far there aren't any of the issues where you're like well this is only going to be the white paper and we wouldn't want to look at that in a deeper you know study so like with that in mind I mean this could almost be something where you know it's essentially rolled up in the methodology itself yeah, you know where you talk about some, you know, like, so instead of having the separate document that's going to have the recommendations, we just start working. You know, we we just work on the methodology, which can, you know, it, it'll always include a background section, and so in that section we can sort of call out some of these issues. And so even if there aren't formal recommendations in it, you're at least kind of noting some of the, you know, the areas where you think that there might be a weakness or there might be something lacking in the policy, and that like, that's meriting further review. And you know, with the assumption being that that in and of itself would be enough for somebody to look at and be like, oh, you know what, that seems like we could tangibly do something like right now to get out in front of this. Um, it, you know, it wouldn't come with the same you know, messaging as like a recommendation would, but I think it, you know, it would still be something that was documented, um, you know, and publicly available. So that that might be the you know the easier route that keeps all of this a lot more cohesive in terms of it's just one specific body of work that's being advanced. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I kind of like where you're where Mr. Hawkins yeah. is going with that. That's kind of my thought as well. And I, I have noticed some uh, uh, pushback on the on, on the part of the city when specific recommendations are made. I feel like sometimes it's not received in the most positive way, but sometimes if you lead them a little bit, uh, they can fill in the gaps and they, they respond more positively. So I, I think that it makes a lot of sense to me. It sounds like a good a good approach. It's it's a sort of pragmatic, you know, it's like right in the middle of what we talked about, but I, it makes a lot of sense. Commissioner Crockett, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? Do you do you want to are, are you behind the idea of creating this white paper to just expose holes 
and uh, get that out there sooner rather than later, hopefully by, you know, midsummer. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I do like the um, idea. And I also wonder, like, what do you guys think about, um, like, following the framework of, like, getting the white paper out with, like, some holes? And then as we kind of define, back to your question, those three, uh, you know, questions and, or, or answers that we, you know, want to articulate through this study, that's where we kind of hit hard on the back end of like a recommend from a recommendation standpoint or something. Yeah. Um, yep. I, like, I, I don't know if that's a, an ideal kind of approach, I would say. No, I, I, I think that's question. a great idea. I mean, the, the more time we have to get this right and formulate you know, a strong understanding of where we're going with this, the better, right? We don't want to just start diving down on a rabbit hole uh without any intent behind it it gets a lot of attention on it too right so yeah. the, um it lets us continue to kind of talk about it, about it during the subcommittee meeting mm -hmm. and on the main committee meeting and we know we get a lot of attention especially on the on the big uh committee meeting more people join people from the press stuff like that and you know you get that public attention and and people do pay, do pay attention i mean we've seen it we've seen the media pick up on things we've seen uh Yep. staff and offices pick up on things and so it's like kind of like what you said mr pino you know it's that soft power uh yep. uh if you will people people pay attention and then they start they start picking up what you're talking about when you keep bringing it up so definitely um so yeah uh as far as question of staff uh timeline on a white paper uh Given I'm hearing generally a consensus, we can have a, a formal vote on it with like a motion in a minute. But uh, if we were to uh, direct staff to draft a, a white paper on acknowledging the differences between current Minneapolis uh, police department practices regarding no knock warrants and the ideals prescribed in the rubric. Uh, that was linked in the chat. Uh, what do you think a timeline, uh, you know, uh, for a, a, a draft that is at least able to be shared around with the larger committee and have a discussion about? Um, yeah, wait, just first, just to clarify too, like, to, do we want to go the formal white paper and recommendation route, or do we want to go the route where essentially it's it's being framed up as part of the like background for the? Yeah, my uh, apologies. Background drafting, I, and I think. So uh, I, I'll stop using white paper and I'll start saying a drafting a background. Does that make more sense? Yeah, and I, I yeah. think to, from from your end, if we can have the, you know, if you can kind of identify, and, and I, I know the number three got thrown out, but I mean, it could be as long as, you know, I think it's something like 20 might be too much, but, you know, if there's five, if there's five questions you want to, you know, I think that's completely, you know, like within, you know, just whatever you determine is a reasonable amount. Yep. Um, I think that the sooner that the group can kind of, uh, like, like determine exactly what those look like as well. Um, I, I think that'll be helpful, but um, for yeah, for the background scope, you know, research questions, methodology stuff. I, I mean, I think we'd like to get that done, um, you know, here in the next couple of weeks. And I don't see why, you know, we've we've already like the, the, a lot of the substantive research has already been done mm -hmm. at this point. So I think it's just a matter of getting something written up and then um, kind of working with this group uh, to fine tune the language and make sure that everybody's uh, on board. So I know Christopher, uh, Christopher has a hand up too. So and since he's going to be um, one of the ones helping with this, I want to let him weigh in. Sure. So I think for the areas where we're pointing out that policy is is missing or mm -hmm. doesn't match up with the comparisons, you know, that research has been at least partially done. You know, we have some best practice recommendations from organizations. We have some co comparisons with similar cities. So that that part is kind of done. I think for the uh, a deeper dive into the data, you know, that would, of course, take longer. We would want those parameters. You know, it sounds like there are three main considerations and that's the basis for the warrant. Um, the outcome in terms of, you know, was whatever the police were looking for found during the search warrant? Mm -hmm. And then the final one is the um, kind of use of force outcome, you know, the safety of, yeah. of everyone involved. Um, I think that those three areas we would need to have the parameters set for what we want to look at, whether that's we take a, you know, a data set from a quarter or whatever it is. And then I also want to just raise one thing that I thought of, and that is that Minneapolis police did change some policies around no knock warrants. Yeah. So I think we'd also want to consider um, 
what impact might come about from those policies so that when the recommendations are made, it's based on the, the most current data. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like the, the, the recommendations that these policies are missing or don't match other cities is kind of done. The, the research part is what would take longer. We would need the parameters for to continue with that. And I think you, you raise a good point there. Um, do you think that it's possible to acknowledge the holes given the, the fact that there have been changes in the policy um, without collecting data from this year, for instance? I think the areas that were talked about is where policy is missing yeah. um, is areas that the changes have not been made to. Yeah. Um, the, which which as, to me sounds like a yes, you know, if, if the changes have not been made, then we should we should at least acknowledge that there has yeah. been consistency. You can't point to the changes that aren't germane to the points that we're raising. Right. Yeah, I think the area where it could potentially come up is to do with the use of force. Yeah. Um, because there's changes to when when announcements are made. But as far and maybe as that can be that... part of the the larger data gathering, and uh, you know, I know you've referenced the 2019 data that was prior to the change that you're referencing, right? Yes, the could change we, was made in 2020. Could we acknowledge, or could we also be collecting now data, data from the start of this year on, um, and do you know a, a year to date comparison? between a you know a control year like 2019 and a year past that policy change to be able to determine whether or not there is you know a difference that is significant enough to be able to determine that the policy has made uh, there there's at least a correlation with the policy change and a change in you know whatever vectors that we're interested in. Um, so the the only thing that I would maybe point out for that is one, the number of warrants, if we're having to manually check them, would be fairly high for an entire year comparison. Mm -hmm. But I think also we might need to control for the difference between like during the pandemic, basically. You know, if yeah. if warrants changed during the pandemic, then if you're comparing a year before versus a year after right now, that might be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but we could definitely, you know, compare data for um, for this year, or as things as things improve, we could select a data set, um, you know, as as the public health situation changes. Yeah, Q two of twenty nineteen to Q two of twenty twenty one comparison might make more sense, seeing as how Q two of twenty twenty, like you've mentioned, is wonky. Yes. Yep. OK. Um, but I do like the descriptors that you use to like basins for the warrant, the success of the warrant and the use of force impact. Um, those those are definitely themes that. I've been hearing a lot um, in these conversations amongst the, the group so far. Um, it's a shame we we only have these meetings for about an hour and we have 10 minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, OK. Um, is everyone at least comfortable enough to have a motion or do I hear a motion to uh, direct staff to draft background? Uh, a background paper to begin, uh, you know, formalizing this process so that way we can, uh, you know, start this paper trail essentially. And that's not a prompt for a motion. I just want to, if there are any like concerns, I want to make sure there's space to raise those concerns. Yeah, I'd be fine with the uh, motion personally. And it's, and it's not all set in stone, you know, if we want to make little tweaks later, especially since we're just doing the background now, we can okay. do that. Sounds I good. <laughs> all right. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we need a formal motion and a vote or can I just direct staff to do so? 
I think you can just direct staff. All right. I will direct staff to begin drafting uh, a, a background on no knock warrants. Um, so that way uh, we can review and potentially uh, share around um, by next audit subcommittee meeting. Sounds good. And in the meantime, since it was asked uh, and it is just a directive, uh, my and our commission's end of the responsibility is we will draft up, uh, you know, three, three to five kind of fundamental questions. We'll workshop that around in an email format and we will submit those questions publicly at the same time that you're submitting uh, that background publicly at next meeting. That sounds good. And, I, and yeah, I mean, we'll absolutely, as this is being developed, if there's questions on our end or some stuff that we want clarification from you, I'm happy to share around the draft version um, as well as kind of as everything's being fine tuned. Great. All right. Uh, we'll move on to our second item of unfinished business, which is regarding coaching um, postponed from May 25th to today. Uh, this is, uh, and I am acknowledging the fact that we're nearing the end of our hour. Um, because this is a different process that, you know, we don't have to weigh between a, a quickly moving white paper versus an analysis uh, that takes more long term. Uh, we left our last conversation with coaching being something that we want to really focus on those those fundamental uh, questions. There have been uh, individuals within our commission who have uh, uh, sent in some questions. I do believe I submitted them for the record last meeting. Um, we can spend the next 10 minutes or so, uh, ideally, uh, doing the exact same thing that, you know, we're, we're aiming to do for no-knock warrants, which is establishing some fundamental questions, uh, and then we can have a, a deeper discussion next meeting about methodology, the scope, uh, where we want to uh, go with that sort of direction. But I think uh, a good use of our time, given that we don't have much time left, is just uh, each going around mentioning a question or two of, well, you know, what is at the core of trying to, uh, you know, what is worth researching about coaching? Why, are, you know, why is it taking up our time? What do you want to know about it? Sound good? All right, um, Commissioner Sparks, if you have any questions, what what would you like to ask about about coaching? Uh, it's hard to have a, a real specific question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, the the main concern I guess that I have, and kind of what I'm hearing from people in my community is that. Uh, it's it's the same concern that some other commissioners have raised. It's that um, is coaching being used as a way to sweep uh, bad behavior under the rug? And mm -hmm. it is a good argument that it could be. It's something that we should probably start looking at. It makes a lot of sense. There's a huge amount of public concern about that right now. I think rightfully so, because there is no transparency into the process. And I know that we met with uh, um, to people from city staff, and I, uh, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I can't recall her name at the moment. But she was the uh, the human resources director, I believe, and she was pretty mm -hmm. clear that you know we have to follow the same HR uh, uh, policies for all city employees, and that includes police. And the real concern, and I, I appreciate that position, and I appreciate what the current rules are. Um, the, the issue that we have with that is, I, like, I understand the need for coaching in our professional lives. Um, that not all discipline, quote unquote, discipline or coaching or whatever should be um, publicly accessible. Uh, what I think we also have to appreciate is that um, police officers, public safety officers, people like that are in a unique position. And it's one thing if you're, you you can 
be a justified mediocre employee anywhere that you want to work and there's nothing wrong with that and there's nothing illegal about that there's nothing bad about that many of us are not exceptional in every way in our lives the trouble is that if you're a three or four five out of ten police officer you make mistakes you don't do things perfectly sometimes that has an outsized impact on the public an outsized negative impact that people in other professions other fields other employees um, don't have, and that mm -hmm. deserves special consideration. I don't think that a one-size-fits-all thought process or uh, uh, rule or policy makes a lot of sense there. Police officers have a very special position in public life. I think that's a that's a great opinion, uh, and I'm glad you're sharing it. Um, how do we formulate that into a question so that way we can get at an understanding of the mechanisms that that are at play you know i wish i'm not too sure yet <laughs> something i've been struggling uh kicking around myself and struggling with a little bit myself yeah and and i agree it's it, it's one of those things where you know uh you know we the role that we have here is and I'm not asking people to be completely unbiased because I think that's a it's a folly idea to try to say like hey we're completely unbiased auditors in this sort of situation we're we're biased right um, and I think if people are truly honest with themselves everyone is to a certain extent right but it's being fair in the way in which we analyze the structures at play to uh prove a point even to people who don't see the things our way right yep. so it's it, i think the the challenge for us is to understand those structures like you talk about transparency right uh and to me that goes to uh the minnesota data practices act uh, and the way in which the city has chosen to find a, a, a hybrid classification between discipline, the formal definition of discipline, and the correction of coaching, you know? Um, so maybe part of that is, is understanding, you know, uh, the city's, trying to understand the city's uh choice because we've we've been given the definitions right through that presentation but we haven't been given the answer to the questions why you know why did we yeah. choose to have the structure that we have right now and was those are some of the questions i had for uh the deputy deputy chief huffman i think that was her title when mm -hmm. she was on that I we I know we didn't all get to ask our questions, but that, yeah, that was kind of one of them. And the other one was, has there ever been any kind of uh, like, do they audit these things an internal pro internal audit, external audit with private results, uh, that kind of thing? I, I don't seem to recall that that coming up. So how accountable yeah. uh, to that hybrid model is anyone actually being held? Because from the public sphere, which is where we all reside and the rules we have to play by, uh, it doesn't seem like there really is a lot of accountability. It just goes and, into sort of a black hole. We don't get to see it. And so you you just asked two questions that I think we can start this conversation of just saying, uh, one, uh, how uh, did coaching is not discipline come about? And why? Because I'm sure there is a reason for it. There, I'm, there, I'm sure there was some sort of justification that uh, chose to go about this way. Um, but also external or internal audits. Um, have they existed? And these might not be those fundamental questions that we ask, right? But at least we're starting to get the ball rolling. Uh, and then next meeting, we'll start limiting those uh, you know, limiting the scope down to particular, you know, what what in particular do we want to, uh, you know, start asking data sets of and, you know, uh, understanding the, the process uh, and giving recommendations for that process. Um, Commissioner Crockett, do you have 
uh, other questions or, you know, uh, either structural or uh, from results of the presentation that we had. I know we've been having this conversation uh, in the last meeting as well, so I want to make sure that your voice is being heard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think my question kind of would play off of, of uh, what Commissioner Sparks mm -hmm. uh, kind of said as well. My, my kind of question would, re would re revolve around like frequency Mm -hmm. um more particularly of the the coaching um i don't remember if they do have a you know a database of you know that that frequency of people being coached or if it you know yeah. happens and nobody uh and then it's you know doesn't get tracked um but i think just knowing the frequency of each individual you know officers uh coaching um and making that connection with or understanding the relationship more of whether you know they've also been disciplined just as much as they're coaching um i think that could that could be something or or tell us something agreed yeah. and i know we've that that exact type of question prompted uh the dashboard update um that uh, we we talked about in our last meeting, or maybe even a meeting prior. Um, I know we're we're a little bit past time now, uh, but uh, Andrew Hawkins, do you have an update for us regarding that that dashboard? Because I do think that's one of those things that it, it probably will persist in the the core of this of just understanding metrics around policy versus performance when it comes to coaching. You know. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, as you know, right now, if you go to uh, the OPCR's public uh, data portal, we have a little bit of information about coaching that's available on the coaching tab there. Um, I mean, not as much as people might like, but that was why one of the that more kind of deep dive was done. And there was that coaching dashboard that I believe we shared out um, that goes from 2014 through 2017. Yep. Um, which is actually uh, prior to that, there was a comprehensive study that was done. I think I've sent this out to the group but in 2014 on coaching um, as well. So that one kind of led to the other. Um, when we're looking at what, what it would take to expand that um, right now, because of the ongoing litigation uh, like with the lawsuit um, against the city around this topic, it's like there's not you know work sort of on pause. However, from just like building out the Tableau side, that's something that we're continuing to work on because there's a number of things where uh, you know it's just, it's a matter of the repository they're stored in. Uh, we use a number of like intermediary systems to pull data from um, you know, our case management software in order to make it make sure that it's you know uh, publicly available and presented on the dashboard with coaching because you know there's documentation and there can be attachments and it, it's a process that can take place you know just within the precincts it's not as straightforward how to do that which was kind of why it was done as uh, that kind of independent project so yeah so we're in the pro process of trying to figure out like you know what does this look like if we want to get this um, updated to where it's something that we just sort of have an ongoing and, you know, it might not be as, you know, at least in its initial iteration, it might not be something that, you know, the data portal updates, every, you know, it's it's live. It's like as things happen, it's able to, you know, update, um, you know, daily, a couple times a day um, and, you know, provide that stuff sort of in real time. With coaching, that might not be as possible with the current structure. It might be something where maybe it's, you know, quarterly, it's it's updated. Um, but we're trying to figure out what this would look like and kind of what the, um, you know, what like the overall lift to, for this to be done on an ongoing basis would look like as well. But, but yeah, I mean, if you've seen the, you know, if you've seen the Tableau portal that we have for the 14 to 17 data, I mean, I think it is very interesting. And the biggest thing is in, in, in keeping in line with data practices law, uh, the current data practices law is, you know, bar, like barring any other like substantive changes, like the biggest thing is just making sure that, um, you know, everything can be lifted up to a point where it's not, you know, like, like it's not personally identifiable. So as long as we can do that, I mean, I, you know, we've done it before. I don't think that's something that we have a, um, any objections to trying to find a way to make this work on an ongoing basis. Yeah, um, and I, I think, I, I know you've been working to try to, you know, uh, play within what is available, what is feasible, but also the the now newly evolving, uh, uh, you know, legal uh, relations that are going on regarding coaching. Um, can you give us a, you know, a, a high level overview? And, you know, this will probably be the last thing that we, we say on it for today, but uh, should we expect uh, to just be talking about coaching in the abstract uh, for a while, at least until things legally have settled? 
um, or is there still room for us to try to collect data? On that, I'd probably want to get um, you know more official opinion from somebody that you know, like in the city, more like the city attorney's office, instead of the one dealing with this. Because um, again, like we can work on sort of having something ready, um, you know, for when everything like settles, if we're able to then you know have something that's ready and tangible that we can launch. However, like any substantive changes to like the way that we're present, like you know, the addition of new information, that might be where we run into something where it's like because of the ongoing lawsuit. Like everything's just sort of on pause until something's resolved. There is the other component too, where depending on what we're looking at, if if there are any changes or anything that come out of mm -hmm. uh, the litigation, then it, you know that could that could also alter the way that we would go about um, doing the portal as well. Okay. So that's something that's worth noting. Again, I know that's a frustrating non-answer, but uh, like that's just kind of the situation we're in. So totally understand. Well, thank you very much, um, and. Uh, I don't want to hold people longer than necessary. Uh, we started about five minutes late and we're five minutes over right now. Um, unless there is uh, more from my colleagues uh, to speak on the matter of coaching, uh, we'll table this item as well uh, until our next meeting. Um, and uh, because the other item of unfinished business uh, ended up in a directive uh, to receive a report, this one will share a little bit more of the limelight than, uh, than it received in this meeting. Um, I know it's, it's not you know, necessarily fair to not give equal treatment, but I also want to be respectful of people's uh, times. Um, are there any final words uh, regarding coaching? Uh, some of those fundamental questions, uh, things you want to make sure are voiced before uh, next meeting. Uh, I'm good over here. Okay. All right, so hearing none, uh, I will table the item of uh, coaching uh, until our next meeting in July. And with that, we've concluded all items on our agenda for this meeting. Seeing no further business to come before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you all for attending uh, and uh, let's just make sure that we are we're working on our end uh, as commissioners for uh, the work to make sure staff are able to do their job between now and next meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you.